When I came to Stanford, there was a very famous scientist in biochemistry who was a Nobel laureate, Paul Berg, mm -hmm. who, who had been teaching virology, animal viruses, which is, you know, what I, I do animal viruses, not plant viruses or bacterial viruses. And he, you know, he said, ah, oh, thank God, somebody to teach animal viruses. He already, he already had his Nobel Prize. He was tired of teaching it. Right. So I ended up teaching all virus groups. That's, what, that's actually one of the reasons I, I can basically uh, be comfortable talking about almost, you know, any virus type. Yeah. These, these ideas, you know, the ideas that get, get uh, I think, out into the popular press that viruses transmit, right? And they transmit at different efficiencies. Everybody just says measles is really transmissible. And, and I, I've heard a very nice comparison. Measles, you know, something like 20 people can be infected for every measles case, right? It's yeah. a very transmissible by respiratory, oral droplet, respiratory yeah. spread. And so that can happen. But because measles takes 11 to 14 days to get to that shedding period, it happens once every two weeks. In that same two-week period, if you had flu, which only infects one or two people mm -hmm. per infected case, it'll go through five or six rounds because so, its turnaround time is like two or three days. Right. And so. So if you do the, the math, you, know, you might get 20 people infected with measles in two weeks because it's so efficient at spread, but because flu is so fast, it'll infect you know, 50 or right. 100 people in two right. weeks because right. you're expanding exponentially right. over that period. And of course, those are, all, those are all kind of mathematical things. They're not right. actual measures, they're estimates. Yeah. And, uh, the, you know, the, the, the piece that comes in at the other side is, well, how many, if, if you have a virus, how many people need to be immune, have had the virus, to actually slow down the transmission in the whole population? And that's also a remarkably variable number. Mm. You know, for influenza, it's roughly 50% of the population. So it's pretty high. Oh. Um, for something like uh, uh, papillomavirus, which is a vaccine for basically a quarter of one gender can be vaccinated and you can cut down on, so, you know, 12% of the population can be vaccinated wow. and you can have an impact <laughs> on the transmission. And, and honestly, scientifically, I can't explain why that would be the case because there's still plenty of what you would call virus naive people out there, but it just shows you the balance. It, it the, the tremendous balance we're in with nature in general and with nature's viruses in particular, you know. And do you feel like we're still getting to know COVID? Yeah. 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 yeah we know, I, I, I tend to think we know more than we admit to know. There's this tendency to be careful. Right. But there are four other human coronaviruses Mm -hmm. They all spread by respiratory droplet. Mm -hmm. They they cause common cold, my, mild mild respiratory illness, not okay. deep lung infection in in most people. But one of those came from a cow, mm -hmm. roughly a hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. Came from living with our wild, with our livestock, mm -hmm. uh, and it adapted mm -hmm. to human transmission, and it's been transmitting since then. I think. One of the concerns right now is that this, although this particular COVID-19 disease, the virus started out probably in bats and came through some intermediate host that was in some live animal market in Wuhan initially. Or, and so it adapted to be not just transmitted to people, but then transmitted from person to person. Mm -hmm. And it's really transmissible. Mm -hmm. um, that it that it won't go away, that it'll be here. Mm -hmm. So until a sufficient proportion of the population has been infected, or we have a vaccine to artificially induce that protection, um, we're going to be worried about this. Mm -hmm. um, that that's that's the reason there's a lot of discussion about this. How long does it take to get a vaccine um, at this point? And s seriously, vaccines don't generally get developed in less than a few years. Right. Uh, it can take a decade, uh, honestly. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but this one is being rushed. And there's some new technologies. Technology definitely will come to play here. And, and mm-hmm. some new technologies being tried. Mm-hmm. Like um, a flu or other RNA virus. This COVID doesn't stay with you after it. It, it, it leaves. It, it, once you are over the infection, the virus is no longer in the person. So there is a potential to get rid of the virus from people and get rid of the virus from the populations. Ever less likely, the more people get infected, right? The Stanford Blood Center just started collecting plasma for East antibodies from people who survive. And they're going to use those right. antibodies from people who survive to give to people with risky cross-sections. Probably mm-hmm. as early as they can catch them, they'll start mm-hmm. to give them the antibody and hope that the antibody that would protect the person who made them from reinfection mm-hmm. will work to slow down or mm-hmm. make the make the disease milder in, mm-hmm. a, mm-hmm. in a person who gets gets given those antibodies. Mm-hmm. That's the hope. I mean, we have a lot on the a lot of marbles kind of rolling around the table right now. It's not clear yeah. where they're all fall, but yeah. What I'm hearing is about kind of unprecedented working together of different, you know, people are really all moving on to this. Is, are you seeing that as well? Or uh, so, mm-hmm. Of course, it's, the, it, it's somewhat human nature, but I think scientists do kind of rally to the call. Um, mm-hmm. I'll, I'll, I, work, I work professionally in the area of herpes viruses, and I've seen several Um, iterations of people getting taken off into other fields. The first was cervical cancer. I mean, herpes was supposed to be the cause of cervical cancer, herpes type Mm 2. Well, it became human papillomavirus back in the 80s, uh, early 80s. And that group of people just flocked from herpes over because they were interested in cervical cancer. They weren't interested in really in herpes. They were interested in that disease. And a lot of virologists went over there. Then AIDS came along and that took a number of people. So, you know, people go, you know, where the action is. They also like to help out. My my, uh, feeling is everybody thinks about what they're doing from a different point of view once Mm -hmm. something like this uh, acute lung Mm -hmm. pathology Mm -hmm. shows up. So people doing inflammatory work We'll start to think. Well, how do what I know? How do how does what I know apply there? So, mm-hmm. so I work in virology. I work on inflammatory pathways that viruses suppress. Her, herpes viruses are very large, complex viruses. They have a lot of genes, and so they make a lot of different what products that kind of fight against the host response. You know, mm-hmm. and that's why they that's why they stay with the individual for life. Once they they're latent viruses, they stay forever in that individual. But the, the, the curious thing is those pathways now are becoming clearly important in inflammatory disease. And so, you know, I, I said, well, we have these animal models. We've been studying various viral uh, herpes virus inflammatory diseases, bacterial inflammatory disease through, mm-hmm. through collaborations mm-hmm. um, that are already ongoing because, you know, you see what you've got, you see what somebody else is doing, you put them together and you get, a, you get some answers. And so right now, I, my feelers are out for a, a, a COVID-19 virus that can be used in mice. The, the, mm-hmm. the one that's infecting people can't. There's uses a different receptor and has a bunch of different species mm-hmm. difference requirements. But the people who work with these emerging viruses, mm-hmm. at Emory and at University of North Carolina, they're already on to adapting the virus to be able to be used in mice. And so once they have one, mm-hmm. um, I'll get together with the folks at Emory. This is, this, is a, this is a virus you have to use under containment. And so I, I can get together with my colleague and do some experiments as soon as we have the right set of tools in place. Uh, likewise, I've been trying to see if I can get interest in using some of the viruses I know as vectors for mm-hmm. this COVID-19 antigens, right? So everybody's talking about having a vaccine in 18 months. Well, the lessons I know from vaccines is they don't all work. <laughs> right. Who knows whether these will work or not? I mean, right. it's hopeful. So additional irons in the fire could be valuable. And so I've been contacting people at Imperial um, College and at uh, University College London, as well as in Germany and Mainz that I know have certain uh, derivatives of herpes viruses that could be valuable 
vectors and kind mm -hmm. of put it together with I know, with what what I know you mm -hmm. know to do some you know, see if we can yeah put something together that makes sense right um, so yeah people start to think gee what do I know right that can be used to help in this situation. Well, those are definitely places of hope. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, I, I mean, the, we'll, I mean, we will get through this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I was very pleased to see Tony Fauci's estimate yesterday was 60,000, not a hundred to 200,000 deaths in the U S mm -hmm. um, seriously. At this point, I think the East coast is the, is the wild card. It's not the West Coast. Um, the West Coast seems to be, have put a cap on the transmission mm -hmm. pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, so it's growing very slowly here. It's still growing. Uh, and mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of people who haven't been infected who could be and who could have problems. But the slower it goes, mm -hmm. the more we give the medical community a chance mm -hmm. to be able to respond. Mm -hmm. And the more we give a chance to drug trials and mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm to show whether they actually work. And once, let, let's say we, we, we know that, that convalescent antibody works mm -hmm. in a, to help suppress the disease, then, then somebody will make a monoclonal antibody and you'll get you know, very, very fancy derivatives of that that can be used very, very effectively. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there's precedence for all these mm -hmm. in, uh, in other virus settings. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was, I was entertained when the president got together all the uh, pharmaceutical, well, he, he got together the pharmaceutical companies mm -hmm. who, who would agree to come, right? Right. And, they, and he went around the room and, you know, they all had very optimistic views and they should be optimistic, mm -hmm. but nobody could give an answer. And of course he kept right. saying, well, tell me whether it's going to be ready. Tell me whether it's going to be ready in two months. And yeah. of course it, it wasn't uh, the yeah. kind of discussion where you're going to get that answer. You're going to get, you know, objective attempts at showing that something does work against some control that says it's really specific and not some sort of a fluke that's yeah. giving us this yeah. result. That's yeah. the basis of the basis of all human, you know, therapies and vaccines is let's do a controlled trial and figure out if it really works. That way right. we're doing things that make sense uh, yeah. Yeah, and are true, not, yeah. not just yeah. panaceas. Well, yeah, science is not a quick fix all the time. Usually not, right? No, no, uh, it, it's not. I, I, I think it's, it's totally appropriate that we are in this period of self-isolation. It seems really odd, but the fact that the community fell into this self-isolation so readily and is so um, behaving so well, particularly what I see around here, Mm -hmm. uh, in the Bay Area, it, it is remarkable. People are not subverting that. They're not being cynical and anything, any, they're, they're, they're really taking this in stride and also to heart. Mm -hmm. And that makes a difference. I and mean, mm -hmm. hopefully people come away from this appreciating that public health requires public cooperation and requires a certain level of trust mm -hmm. that up until this point seem to be evaporating in our society mm -hmm. um, remarkably. And so mm -hmm. if there's a, a lesson here, it's that there are certain viruses don't care uh, <laughs> about what people say. Right. Viruses just want to make more of themselves. Right. That's it. That's their only pressure is to make more of themselves. They don't want to kill anybody. Mm -hmm. They just want to replicate and get around to new hosts. And if they can do that, mm -hmm. they're happy and they get, get around. But if they can't do that, they get knocked out of the population. Mm -hmm. We eliminated smallpox several decades ago. Mm -hmm. We almost eliminated polio. I mean, that's had its ups and downs, but it's close, still close. Mm -hmm. We couldn't eliminate measles, mumps, rubella, mm -hmm. um, any number of viruses that are only in people, only infect people. Uh, we also can get rid of these zoonotic diseases. We got rid of SARS after only about 3,500 cases, right? Mm -hmm. That didn't transmit as readily as SARS-2, it's COVID virus. Mm -hmm. um, but it did transmit from person to person and it was eliminated. 
Yeah. But you've got other examples where um, viruses that emerged, got into the human population, were pushed back out. Mm -hmm. um, so we do have the capacity mm -hmm. with cooperation to and get time. that done. Yeah. And time, and time, yeah. 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 and spacing. Yeah. Spacing.